Hello and welcome again to another video in the series Together in Christ, following the Northern Picts, journeying through the past to discover paths to our future. Today I want to talk a little about St Ninian, proto-evangelist of Scotland, whose feast day is traditionally celebrated on the 16th of September. Perhaps there may not be too much that will be a revelation to you, as Ninian has been a rather contentious saint for hagiographers since the earliest days. In some circles, he's been completely dismissed as a figment of some biographer's imagination. There has been an increase in the number of books and articles about different aspects of his life, and modern media has also provided new content for the inquirer. But there is little new evidence available about this holy man of God or meaningful interaction with the primary sources. Steady, ongoing archaeological research continues to progress in and around Whithorn and Galloway and our understanding of the town and its environs history continues to be revised. There are, however, ongoing questions, interpretations and arguments continually raised by academics and others about the real identity and life of this proto-evangelist of our nation. His date and origins, his role and achievements, his means and locus of his mission and ministry, to name but a few. It's always interesting to hear other views including those of the academics. However, Ninian, whoever he may have been, was among that group of missionaries who were responsible for bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to my country some 1600 years ago. And that in itself is something worthy of celebration. There's been tremendous progress in the field of archaeology over the past couple of decades. However, in the earliest phases of site excavation at Whitton, there was no stone church building or monastery found, but some evidence of early Christian practices. There was also verification of sophisticated trading contacts from Galloway reaching to Gaul, the Mediterranean coast and North Africa. There was proof of literacy and knowledge of what we would call early church liturgy. An elite material culture, similar to that in both monastic and other high-status secular settlements, was also discovered. In addition, there were indications of centuries of continued occupation in the area evidence of Christian practice and of a braid of cultures, languages, artistic styles and technologies as the Macar settlers or invaders from elsewhere occupied and promoted its famous shrine and environs. Archaeologists here and historians continue to debate the findings on the site and around its sister site at Kirkmadron in the nearby ruins of Galloway, where early burial stones, post-dating the famous 5th century Latinus stone, may indicate an early monastery. Early Whithorn was probably a commercial and trade centre, possibly with the royal connections, and there's some evidence of the first Christian converts' burials and funeral rites. Investigations into the Whithorn story will continue for many years to come and will remain at the centre of debate about the nature of post-Roman society and culture in Britain and the nature and spread of Christianity, craft and trades and the relationship between the parts of Britain and Ireland and the relations between secular and ecclesiastical society. You can learn a lot more about the uh, the Whithorn 
uh, developments on their website. It's www.whithorn.com. Or even better, why not visit Whithorn? The Trust Visitor Centre in town is a great wee place to go, and maybe even for those who are more physically able to, consider walking the Whithorn Way pilgrimage route. Now back to Ninian. If we are to rely on the so-called 12th century traditional narrative of Ninian's life by Aylred, containing almost everything that is related by the Venerable Bede and the 8th century Miracula Nini Episcopi, then we find statements about both the fixed date for the life of Ninian and the construction of his monastery, Candida Casa. The purpose of both the Miracula, as its title shows, and Aylred's life, however, are not to provide all the facts of Ninian's life, but to emphasise Ninian's holiness through his miracles. Bede's account may be more factual, as told to him, but Clancy opined that in his Real Saint Ninian, which was published in, the, in his review, that this account is a concise later addition to Bede's original text. This fulfilled his purpose implicitly by comparing a type of ecclesiastical organisation that he disliked with one of which he completely approved, resulting in many contentious and unproven points to be forever discussed. The story that follows, therefore, draws from the traditional narrative and some other sources, and doing so with a conscious non knowledge of some of the difficulties indicated by numerous academics and experts on our subject. It's said that Ninian, a Briton, was born around AD 360, and his father was a British chieftain who had converted to Christianity. As the young Ninian had a strong desire to study Christianity, he travelled to Rome to further his learning. And the Pope of the time welcomed Ninian and arranged that church tradition, dogmas and doctrines were available for the young man to study in depth. Now, after a period of some 15 years in Rome, Ninian was ordained to the priesthood and episcopate by Pope St. Sergius and sent back to evangelise his native Britons, establishing a small monastic community in the region now called Galway, before settling out to evangelise other areas, including Pigland, Strathclyde and Wales. He was the first missionary bishop residing in what is now Scotland, for whom do we have any record. Now, although Bede acknowledges Nishin and Ninian's mission to the southern Picts, who inhabited the old Roman province of Valencia, south of the Forth, others consider that early Christian ministry, missionary activity in the eastern and northern reaches of Scotland were initiated by Ninian and his small band of evangelists, the most influential and successful of which were St. Dorostin and his three, arguably preparing the way for the advent of St. Columba's later re-evangelization of the region. There may be some truth in that Ninian's reminiscences of the, the churches that he'd seen during his travels in mainland Europe had inspired him to build something more substantial than the simple wattle habitations that he found in Galloway. His visit to St. Martin, the third bishop of Tours, and founder of the great monastery at Lugugé, certainly had much influence on Ninian's monastic foundations and his style of evangelism. It's been suggested that through his contacts made during his travels in Europe, Ninian arranged for masons from Gaul to complete that first stone church in Britain called Candida Casa, or the White House on the Isle of Whitton. Peninsula. 
Ninian. Laboured long and hard, and was reputed to be more than seventy years of age when he died, and was buried at his community settlement that he had built in Galloway and dedicated to St Martin. Later, that church was renamed after Ninian and became a renowned place of pilgrimage for people from Scotland, Ireland and England. And thereafter, many churches in Scotland were built and dedicated to St Ninian. And in fact, there's even a pre-Reformation memorial altar that was endowed by the Scottish nation in the Carmelite Church at Bruges. Some suggest that the majority of places named after Ninian date from some centuries later as his cult gained popularity. Or when it was pitted against Columbus's increasingly popular cult, particularly in the 8th to 12th centuries. Clancy opines that despite the over optimistic work of Douglas Simpson earlier in the 20th century, there is still not a single church dedication to Ninian that can be shown to be earlier than the 12th century. It's not unrealistic to suggest, however, that Ninian and his followers evangelization endeavours touch many parts of Scotland, from St Ninian and Ninian's Isle in Shetland to northern and southern Pickland and the Isle of Whithorn in Galloway. I read of a story that during the 19th century, while restoration work was being carried out at a local church in Turriff in Aberdeenshire, workers discovered a beautiful piece of an old fresco with a portrait of St Ninian. Sad to relate that unfortunately the fresco wasn't preserved and has been lost forever. However, there, there is a sketch of the fresco available. Further west of Aberdeenshire, the old borough of Nairn was placed under Ninian's patronage and many holy wells from Galloway to Orkney bear this holy man's name. The site of the chapel on St Ninian's Isle, Shetland, was excavated in the late 1950s and in 2000 and 2001. The dedication to Ninian, however, is not thought to be contemporary with the founding of the chapel. Evidence of traces of a wall have been found beneath it, so it's not the earliest chapel on the site. And a treasure trove was buried under a cross-marked slab close to the altar and consisted of differing items and styles of silver that included bowls, weaponry and jewellery and was considered either a familial or an ecclesiastical hold. That collection is now in the National Museum of Scotland where replicas can be seen in the Shetland Museum. The graveyard adjacent to the chapel reveals a continuity of pre-Christian and Christian burials. An excavation found a group of babies aligned east-west and with tiny crosses at their heads and were buried under empty cysts and may represent the point at which Christian practices were being introduced with a pre-Christian tradition still lingering. Other Early Christian Pictish finds include corner posts from stone shrines and stones with crosses carved onto them. In and around Caithness, our friends of the Northern Pilgrimage Way have established a new trail that includes places related to the missionary endeavours and communities established by St Droston, one of Ninian's missionary collaborators. There is also evidence of these early Christian evangelists' journey through Fife and Angus, across Buchan and Banffshire, into Murray and beyond. Ninian may not have personally evangelised all these areas, however his followers certainly did, paving the way for Columba to re-evangelise in due course. Before finishing, it's fair to say that we may learn about a method of evangelism from Ninian, Droston 
and his three, of whom I spoke of in an earlier video. These early missionaries belonged to a community of Christian believers who upheld the gospel and a way of life specific to their community and the communities that they would establish. Their foundations were based upon gospel values of loving the Holy Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and also their neighbours. In order to do this effectively, the residential monastic community and the missionaries themselves committed to a life of regular prayer, several times a day, and also fasting, the study of Holy Scripture and the tradition of the Church's Fathers, the provision of shelter, refuge and hospitality, as if every visitor was Christ himself, the holistic care of people and creation, embracing what they called penitentials, with penance and restorative justice. They were keen to pilgrimage for Jesus, freely accepting martyrdom, if required. They developed an awareness of the context and culture of those people to whom they offered the way, truth and life. The missionaries worked together as small groups, establishing small Christian communities that grew, training and appointing future missionaries, usually laity, to go forth led by a couple of experienced foundational missionaries and repeating the evangelizing process time and time again, spreading the gospel. Sometimes these communities were led by either a bishop or an abbot, with priests assigned to new communities depending upon their circumstances and availability. A similar method of evangelization has successfully worked for centuries thereafter. In the most dispersed rural or bustling urban communities of the 21st century, it's becoming more important to form small groups of Christians for mutual support, prayer and worship, holistic formation, and always with the aim of taking the gospel beyond the group of people living in the outlying communities. This is something that can be done when two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, maybe God is calling you to create or participate in such a group, following in that missionary tradition of Ninian and Droston. Why not take that thought to prayer? I wish you a happy feast of St Ninian and God bless you and take care in the days ahead. Bye for now.